And we're going to re unrecess, or we're going to reopen uh, HB 1356. Yes. And I would recognize Re Representative Harvey to, to speak. So good, good morning. My name is Representative Catherine Harvey. Um, I represent Cheshire District 1, which at the moment is uh, uh, Chesterfield, Westmoreland, Hinsdale, and Walpole. I am the Democratic ranking member of Fish and Game and Marine Resources. I'm here to introduce this bill to you as, and to explain um, my two reasons why I believe this bill should be ITL'd. Um, this bill sets a very dangerous precedent in that it is giving the right to set seasons and take by the legislature instead of by fish and game. By law, laws that we've written, uh, fish and game have that duty, that responsibility to set the uh, limits and the seasons and the methods of take. They, we, we gave them that responsibility because they are the ones who have the data. They have the wildlife biologists, they have the hunters with boots on the ground, and um, they have the data. It's data that they've collected over many, many years so that they can make a decision. They also have the process by which it can be changed. They have a rulemaking process, um, and so they can respond to changes in a fairly quick manner. So. Um, at one time, in the 1950s, we, the legislatures, were the ones who set all of the limits. Um, and it was disastrous. Turkeys became extinct in the state of New Hampshire. And I believe, don't quote me on the date, but I believe it was in 1956, Fish and Game exchanged 20 Fisher cats with Pennsylvania for 20 turkeys and introduced them in Walpole, New Hampshire, to bring back our turkey population. Um, it's, it's one of the biggest success stories of Fish and Game because uh, today our turkey population is thriving. But Fish and Game had to do that in order to overcome the mistakes that the legislatures were making since they had no data. And when we don't have data, to make our decisions, we oftentimes vote the wishes of our constituencies and to the detriment of our wildlife, especially at that time, our turkeys. Now, some of you might be saying, well, squirrels are not um, endangered. There's lots of them, and um, that's true. But you have to remember that every uh, thing that is living on this earth has a place in the food chain. So if we have any kind of decline, in our squirrel population for any reason, whether it's hunting or some sort of catastrophic weather event, that can affect the animals that use those squirrels as their food. So it could affect our um, fisher, our bobcat, our weasels, um, any number of animals that depend on an adequate supply of squirrels. Um, there used to be a, a I'm going to show my age here, but there used to be a commercial for margarine on TV that said it's not nice to uh, mess with Mother Nature. And that's kind of what this bill is all about. It's, it's not a good idea to mess with Mother Nature. She knows what she's doing. The second um, reason I oppose this bill is because it's just not necessary. If you have any animal, whether it be a squirrel or a bear, that is doing damage to your property, to your house, you have by law the right to take that animal. We don't need to write another law that says you can hunt squirrels. So if I live in Spofford, New Hampshire, and my, the siding on my house is being eaten by a squirrel, I can take that squirrel. But I don't have to allow the people in Berlin to also go out and um, hunt squirrels. It won't do my property any good, and it may harm the population. So I would uh, respectfully ask you to uh, ITL this bill. Um, it's not necessary, and it may be very detrimental to our population in the state. Fish and Game is, is the, the body that has the information to make those rules, not legislatures. Thank you.
Thank you for your testimony. Questions from the committee? Seeing none, thank you very much. Uh, Dan Bergeron, New Hampshire Fish and Game. I don't know if Kevin or Jordan wants to sit with them or after, okay. <laughs> Can I ask you a question before we get started? Absolutely. Now, I have two fish a cat in my backyard. I found them last night. All right. Um, is there is there a season on them or is it open year round? Um, there's a season on Fisher. Oh, there is a season. Yep. Okay, it's yep. not year round. Yep, uh, no, not year round. Yeah, and but if um, they're in my yard, I can take them because they're a nuisance to my dogs. If they're in the act of causing damage, yeah. So that's what the RSA says is that the the wildlife would have to be in the act of causing damage for you to be able to take it. Yeah. So my word against theirs, right? <laughs> well, get, Colonel Jordan's here for that to answer that part of the question. <laughs> would, would that include bears in, in dumpsters? Um, so, a, so a bear in a dumpster, um, I, you know, you'd have to make the argument that that was that was it was causing damage. Um, so, you know, we we try and deal with the public through a, a lot of this through education. Um, there's a lot of misconceptions about bears and, and certainly fisher. Um, a lot of people feel that fisher are dangerous and, and routinely take dogs and cats. Um, that's not typically the case. Usually it's something else. Fisher are fairly small. I mean, they certainly could. It's, it's probably more likely that they might take a cat as opposed to a dog, depending on the size of your dog. But oftentimes, um, you know, an animal might have been hit by a vehicle and, and scavenged and not found. But, but we don't find that fisher in particular um, routinely prey on people's pets, maybe with the exception of cats, but. Um, yeah, I, I, if maybe if the bear was tearing the dumpster apart, um, but if the bear was just in there feeding and then was leaving, um, but but what the RSA says is that it has to be causing actual and substantial damage is the wording that's used. All right, so now for the real threat, these little gray squirrels. The gray squirrels. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> So uh, thank you for allowing me to testify with you this morning. Uh, my name is Dan Berger. I'm the chief of the Wildlife Division for New Hampshire Fish and Game. Um, so gray squirrels have seasons in all five New England states and New York. Um, Vermont, Connecticut, New York have similar seasons to New Hampshire. Maine, Massachusetts, Rhode Island have shorter seasons and a later start date. Um, it's important to note that none of these other states have open seasons on gray squirrels. The department uses um, data from hunter surveys um, to get sighting rates on gray squirrels to track trends in their population. Um, that data has shown that gray squirrel populations have been largely stable um, to increasing in, in some, some years. Um, gray squirrel populations are typically, um, um, you see big shifts, you can see big shifts annually based on natural food availability. Um, so, you, and most people probably recognize this, I think it was 2018. Um, we had a mast failure, so there was virtually no acorns or beech nuts. Um, that caused gray squirrels to travel longer distances to look for food, and there was thousands of them dead on the roadways. So you can have these dramatic shifts in, in squirrel populations based on natural food availability. So if you have several years in a row, you could see pretty drastic declines in your population. Um, as, as Representative Harvey had noted, um, the existing RSA 207-56 um, um, had expressly granted the department the authority to manage squirrel populations. Um, this bill would remove that authority um, and would make it more difficult for the, apartment, for the department to adjust our seasons and effectively manage the squirrel population. Um, so it would, it would virtually remove our rulemaking authority, um, which is how we adjust seasons now. We've done it a couple times for gray squirrels in the past several years. Um, where we've actually lengthened the season for gray squirrels. Um, one of the main justifications for this was uh, the damage that squirrels cause. Um, we've talked about this a bit already, um, but current RSA 207-26 um, already allows landowners to take animals that are in the act of doing damage um, to their property or to their crops. Um, so there's already a remedy there. Um, further, the department has administrative rules in part FIS 304, um, which specifically address wildlife damage even further. Um, so we have uh, depredation permits for deer, bear, turkey, um, any number of species um, that provides even more opportunity for landowners um, and particularly farmers um, to take wildlife that are causing damage. Um, so that's another avenue that we could look at um, to address damage on squirrels. 
um, and I think would be more effective because those two, that RSA and those, those administrative rules would focus um, effort where damage is occurring and not spread it out over the state in areas where there may be no damage occurring. Um, so we feel the current season framework is a good compromise between competing interests um, and that we already have uh, remedies for damage through RSAs and through administrative rules. So, um, so I would just ask the um, committee um, to oppose the bill and I thank you and I will take any questions. Senator Gray. Uh, yes, the bill doesn't mention red squirrels. Um, my experience is red squirrels are much more uh, damaging to property than gray squirrels uh, and also depleting the property, uh, the uh, population of the gray squirrels might increase the property of the uh, population of uh, the red squirrels. I'd like to get you to comment on those. Um, so, yeah, so there, I believe there, actually there is, there is no season for red squirrels and chipmunks. Um, the, as to whether or not the, I, I don't think that, I don't think that decreasing the gray squirrel population, you'd necessarily notice a big difference in the red squirrel population. Um, again, they're largely dictated by natural food availability. Um, so you could, it, you could in certain times, if you had um, natural food failures or mass failures in, it, it combined with increased harvest, um, potentially, um, but it would, be, it would be difficult to say for certain. Um, Senator Guider. Very quickly, when you say there's no season for, for red squirrels or chipmunks, does that mean it's open any time or they can't be taken at all? Um, no, th so they, Colonel Jordan might be able to help with this. The, the, uh, taking gray, uh, taking red squirrels and chipmunks. There's no, there's no closed season on that, so okay. they, they are allowed. It's open all year round. Yes. Thank you. Who would shoot a chipmunk? How brutal? Yeah. Uh, are gray squirrels indigenous to this region? Yes. They didn't come from Europe. No. no. <laughs> Is a have a heart trap uh, considered hunting? Um. Well, so I guess it would depend on what you did with the animal after you trapped it. Um, you would, if, if you were trapping it and releasing it in a nuisance situation, then no. So if I brought it to my neighbor's house, it would be okay. Um, <laughs> ty ty typically, you need landowner permission, but yeah. Up to Berlin or something. Okay. Um, further questions from the committee? Seeing none. Thank you very much for your testimony. Um, Thank you. Yeah, I'm doing. I'm going through the, the rest of the, the representatives now. Um, I have Representative Moffitt, uh, who was in support and wanted to speak. Okay. Do you do you want? Uh, okay. So. Representative Reed. Yes, sir. Come on up. No, don't apologize. Sorry, I'm actually a, a Boston, <clears throat> Boston duck tour driver, and I gotta gotta get down to Boston. Okay, um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, honorable members of the committee. For the record, my name is Ellen Reed. I serve as the clerk of Fish and Game. Um, the chair uh, knows that I have immense respect for him. I will owe him a couple of beers after this testimony. Uh, but uh, first I want to give you a brief history on the original bill, and then I want to talk uh, a little bit about the concept of good governance. Um, so the original bill was brought before us basically more or less as housekeeping. Uh, it became apparent that apparently the date at which we had set the squirrel season um, was two weeks earlier than what it looked like it was meant to be, and we could, no one could find any records of why that change had happened. Um, the department had moved several other similar species to October 1st, and uh, it was originally set at the end of the last weekend in September. And for some reason, the, the gray squirrel was the only species that got moved to September 1st, and there was no record at all of a motion being made or anything. So because uh, scientific studies of all the, the area, all of New England, show that uh, mother squirrels are still lactating at the beginning of September, 
it seemed reasonable to move it a couple of weeks. So it seemed like a pretty innocuous bill, just a couple of weeks difference based on what all of our neighboring states do and uh, historical precedent. Um, so I was surprised when the bill was amended to completely remove the season on squirrels because A, no one had asked for it, but B, typically speaking, and, and again, good governance, from the point of good governance, you hope for amendments to be moving towards the middle or moving towards areas of common ground. And this was taking something that was put in in good faith and completely flipping it on its head. Um, and I, I don't think that that's the way things should be done. And I don't think that's the way that the people of New Hampshire want things to be done. This would be the, as far as I am aware, and certainly you have members of the department who can correct me, the only species on which we would prohibit the department whose job in RSA is to set seasons for all of the species in New Hampshire for the purposes of conservation. And this would be creating a precedent where we prohibit them from doing the very job that they are mandated to do. And um, as the uh, chief wildlife biologist brought up, there are population fluctuations uh, of all populations in New Hampshire. We had squirrel mageddon a few years ago. What if something would happen where all of a sudden we needed to put a limit on squirrels? What if you know their predatory, predatory species had a boom and all of a sudden squirrel populations decline quickly? The legislature cannot act as quickly as the department can. And again, that is the department's role. So again, I don't think this followed the uh, policy or the principles of good governance, the principles of good faith engagement, um, and nobody asked for this. And uh, that's all I have to say. Happy to take questions, and then I'll go drive a duck. Questions from the committee. We actually had one break down in Boston once. <laughs> they, well, you know, if it was a few years ago, it was probably one of the original ones built by Rosie the Riveter. So, I mean, they're doing, they're doing pretty good. It's wonderful. For 70 plus years. Seeing no questions, thank you for your Thank you so much, Mr. Chair. Uh, so, Representative Moffitt's not out there? Okay, uh, that's right, he's in committee. That's fine. Uh, Representative Erica Lang didn't want to. Okay. Yeah, Representative Pearl, are you in here? I didn't see him in the audience. Okay, he's right there. You want to talk about some squirrels, Representative? Yes. Right. Thank you. Yeah, I am ready for you. You got no, and now we're gonna put you at yes. You have the floor. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, and thank you, members of the uh, Energy and Natural Resources Committee. Appreciate you uh, hearing House Bill 1356. And for the record, my name is Representative Howard Pearl from Loudoun. Briefly, I want to support the uh, bill that came over from the amended bill that came over from the House. Uh, as many of you know, I operate a large maple farm in Loudoun, and these the, the gray squirrels, along with all of the other squirrels, are. And, and chipmunks are a huge nuisance for us in the operations that I do with my produce and my maple business. And I've got some pictures that I'll circulate around that I send to you. So the, these animals do a uh, tremendous amount of damage in the crops that I raise and in the maple infrastructure that I have and in my buildings, as you'll see in the photos. And so um, I w briefly just want to say I support uh, the bill as it's amended, and I, I hope you will pass it. And uh, Certainly open it up for many questions. I know you always run late, so I'm going to make it easy for you. <laughs> thank, thank, thank just, uh, just We had heard from the chief of wildlife that if, um, if animals causing damage to your crops or property, you can take it. So you, you could do it even if this bill doesn't pass. Right? I can personally, yeah. but my workers cannot. And that's the challenge we run into and my neighbors who want to help. And uh, my maple orchards run over uh, several hundred acres, so you know, almost 300. And it's impossible for me to manage all of that myself. And I have neighbors and, and that are willing to assist. They see the damage that they cause. And so that's why it's important. I guess the, the note I'll make is red squirrels currently don't have a season. And we can take those any time of the year. But gray squirrels do have a season. And I personally don't see the difference myself. There's, uh, we haven't eliminated the red squirrel population. And we won't eliminate the gray squirrel population. But we do need the opportunity to eliminate those that are, are bothering the, the crops and the, and the infrastructure that we have in place. Senator Guida. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Representative, thank you for your testimony. Uh, is it apparently you have to catch an animal in the act 
of doing the damage to legally, under current law, be able to take that animal. Is that correct? Well, certainly, we uh, th if they're in the vicinity of the area where we're doing it, yes, we consider that in the act. If they're you know on the trees or where we're we're getting damage or in the field, you know, I may not see them where they squash in their mouth, but uh, I certainly see them in the squash field, and we take them consider that to be in the act. Fishing game has always allowed us to do right. that. Right, Mr. Um, Colonel Jordan is indicating with a head nod that you have to catch the animal in the act to be able to, be able to take it. Correct. So a 300-acre farm with, I'm assuming, miles worth of tubing and other stuff, the maple yes. and your crops and so forth, it's not possible for you to be monitoring the entirety of your rigs and so forth over, or at, at all times? Well, right? certainly not. It, it's impossible for me to see them with the tubing in their mouth chewing, but we certainly uh, see them in, in the tree and in the orchard where the damage is occurring. But yes, I mean, the technicality is, yes, you have to see them in the act. Thank you. Seeing no further questions, thank you for your testimony. Thank you. Have a great day. All right, Christina, did you, uh, did you want to? Christina Snyder? You were here waiting patiently not too long ago, so you do want to speak, correct? Yes. Yeah. Now it is. Okay. <clears throat> Take a deep breath. <laughs> Uh, yeah, um, my name is Christina Snyder. I'm from Chester, and I can kind of say that I'm really the reason that everyone is here today because I am pretty much the factor that brought the original bill. Uh, Rep. Bolden contacted me because she saw my struggles to try to actually shorten the gray squirrel season, hence how we got here today. And, um, you know, to be honest, I'm extremely frustrated with this whole process and that we are even here right now because I'm a member of the public. I have zero power. I'm not a representative. I'm not a senator. And I live in a district where, truthfully, my representatives don't really give me a lot of uh, attention when I, with my concerns. So I'm, I'm increasingly frustrated with politics and how all of this is happening. I'm very active in animal activism. I go to every fish and game commission meeting. I go to every fish and game hearing. I know Colonel Jordan, I know Dan Bergeron because they see me, we talk. When you want something changed, you need to be involved with fish and game first, which I have done. I've gone to the hearings and I have put in my, my testimony and my, my thoughts and my, my I, with this original bill, I did research, I did a petition, I went to hearings, I got people to support it. I went through all of the work. I went through the process. And what I see that these representatives have done is they went from here to here and did nothing in between. That's like a slap in my face that I had to go through all of this and the support, the public support was actually in favor of the original bill, two to one. And what I saw was, hey, here's an amendment. We don't need to do any of this. Because I will tell you, I have never once seen Representative Lang or Representative Pearl at a public hearing. I've never seen them at the biennial rulemaking saying that there are nuisance problems with squirrels. I've never seen anyone from the public ever approach Fish and Game at any of these public hearings saying that there's nuisance issues with squirrels. I, oh, absolutely I will. I'll, I'll say that right now I saw that 89, there was 89 in, uh, opposed to this. There was 12 in support. The majority were state representatives. Like I said, I've never heard this issue brought up. And there are ways to protect your maple tubing. I, I did research. I contacted someone out in Wisconsin. He's invented this thing called Squirrel Guard. There's, there's stuff you can spray on your tubes. And I've, I didn't hear anyone say that they've tried these methods before. And what you can do is you, there's a, a route you can take. You can talk to Fish and Game. You can say, I have these issues. Work with me. What can we get done in my town? There was, there's an apple orchard, and Fish and Game paid a lot of money and put a huge fence up all around that apple orchard to help that, that farmer with their deer. Those steps can be taken. 
where you can work with fishing game and then you know if need be and you want to do legislation down the road but but my point kind of was let's go through all of that first and then come here and I don't see any evidence that any of that was done so I'm asking you to ITL even if you despise squirrels just to respect the process let them go through the process and then come to this point please and that's what I have to say thank you I'm going to hope that uh, fishing game will come back here in a few well, minutes. I'm not done with Colonel Jordan. He's coming. All right. Uh, but my question would be, uh, would you be averse to open season exclusive of the lactating season? I, I, I would, it, you know, that kind of, they, they have two breeding uh, in the spring and in the fall. So that still would en encompass most of the year. And I think right now, I mean, there's close to five. Uh, they've already lengthened the season by a month. It, just a few years ago, it used to end on December 31st. Now they've extended it through January 31st. You, if, if need be, you know, they start mating in uh, late February and March. I mean, right, right now, the season as it stands, I think, is, is OK. I wanted to actually shorten it. Um, because wildlife rehabilitators were getting orphan squirrels in September, and a lot of the public were concerned about that, and then I, it just correlates, so overlaps with, with hunting. Uh, yeah. So how long is that season of lactation, whether the young are born and the mom is taking care of them? Well, is it like four it, weeks? It, is it a month? Is, you know, it goes to, uh, you know, you could probably ask uh, Dan a little better, sure. but... My, I go through with, with what the wildlife rehabilitators have told me, and I think it was eight weeks, and they said that even after they're weaned, they still are kind of dependent upon the mother uh, to learn how to get gather food. Thank you. Seeing no further questions, thank you for your Good morning, uh, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. My name is Weldon Bosworth. I'm from Guilford, New Hampshire. Uh, I've got a lot of experience in ecology. I have a PhD in 45 years of working in that field. I know quite a bit about the interaction of various species. And although my focus was on marine biology, I certainly understand terrestrial and wildlife biology. First of all, a couple of things. Fishers are great to have in your backyard. I wish I had one because you can take beautiful photographs. They kill all the rodents that might be around your house and they won't get a cat or a dog unless it's, they go on, the cat or the dog goes on to you know, maybe harass the fisher. We've talked a lot about squirrels. What good are they anyway? Uh, gray squirrels and red squirrels are actually a very important member of the ecosystem. They help the forest regenerate. They eat these seeds and they uh, go dump them or hide them in different places. And these seeds, many of them they don't find, they grow. So they're, they're really worthwhile. I think the idea that uh, we as New Hampshire residents should decimate all the rodents around here is, is ill-conceived. First of all, these are important members of the ecosystem, not for the reasons I mentioned, but also for the fact that they support a whole host of predatory species like fox, like fisher, like raccoons, like things that eat, you know, young squirrels, uh, crows, a number of birds, owls, things like that. Without the base of the food chain, we're going to have trouble with an ecosystem that is already severely damaged here in some respects in New Hampshire. And I'm speaking primarily because of the, about the, uh, absence of predators, or the, let's say the diminution of the population of predators, which based upon Fish and Game's data is really declining. And I think if we had more of them, there'd be fewer squirrels, so we wouldn't be talking about this. So this bill as amended is either unnecessary or inappropriate, and the reasons have been discussed already by Senator, I mean, Representative Harvey and, and Mr. Bergeron. I want to say one thing. The, the thing that came across clear to me in the House hearing was the, 
the, the justification for this amendment by Representative Lang was to take the weight off of fish and game so they didn't have to deal with controversy. I've been working with fish and game for about six years on various wildlife issues, and believe me, they know how to deal with controversy. So I think that is, is not a really great rationale. And I'd just like to draw out an analogy. We're talking about squirrels now, but let's say somebody came in and wanted to change the, uh, the bag limit on white-tailed deer because, uh, let's say, they, they think there's not, not enough around, so they want to reduce it. You go to the hearing on this, and all of a sudden, out of that hearing comes an amendment that says, white-tailed deer are open throughout the year. White-tailed deer season is open throughout the year. I think you have to put it in that framework to understand what it, uh, the, the meaningfulness of this. And last, to <coughs> answer a question by uh, Senator Guida, Guida, the, the Guida. Sorry about that. I, I'll leave now. <laughs> But uh, generally, the gray squirrels here have a couple of breeding seasons, and they may start as early as uh, late May and go through September. And if you count the, uh, <clears throat> the amount of time that the young are helpless in the nest and then learning the rules of the road, that could extend into November. So it's a pretty long time. It's about six months. The original bill contemplated, with a little bit of, uh, I think, uh, com compassion, to stop the season when they're, when basically the young are in the uh, nest and the females lactating. No, no more questions about Fisher then. Good morning, Senators. Representative Tim Lang. I represent the towns of Tilton and Samberton. Uh, I am the chairman of the House Fish and Game Committee, as well as serve on Ways and Means in Jalcar. Um, I'm in my third term here in the House. So just a little history on this bill. Um, this bill passed my committee on a 12 to 7 bipartisan vote. This bill passed the House 194 to 174 in a bipartisan vote. The bill has originally recommended a change in the season overruling the fish and game season by shortening the existing season on gray squirrels. Upon listening to testimony, it was discovered that other than beavers, which are managed by the fish and game fur bearing regulation, all other rodents, small game like porcupine, groundhogs, red squirrels, have an open season year round. Testimony revealed that this particular small game was considered a pest animal. And and causes significant amount of damage to both, to both private property as well as the agricultural industry. Currently, when a gray squirrel is shot out of season upon a complaint, it requires a significant amount of effort by fish and game and or local law enforcement to verify the substantial damage requirement um, to justify a shooting out of season. Additionally, there was no testimony that this small game in any way was endangered, and we all remember the 2018 squirrel apocalypse on our roadways a few years ago when even that mass casualty squirrel event did not cause significant impact on the squirrel population at all. It is only 9% of hunters in this, that hunt small game and even a smaller subset of those hunters that actually hunt squirrels. However, many hunters use hunting squirrels to teach good hunting practices to their children. So such a big eyed cuteness, it's hard to uh, it's hard for many to regard squirrels as a troublesome pest that they really can be. While they may appear soft, fluffy, and harmless, the common gray squirrel is nonetheless a nuisance pet. Pest. They can cause serious damage to property and, like rats, play host to a numerous number of diseases that pose a health risk to the public. In addition, the gray squirrel is considered to be a serious forestry pest, causing considerable damage every year to woodlands, especially saplings and young trees. Based on all of this, the bipartisan majority agreed that a year-round season was appropriate and will, will reduce even slightly the workload of the already overburdened fishing game conservation officers, allowing them to focus on 
things like poaching and hunting out of season. I'll be happy to take any questions. I wholly urge you to uh, support the bill as sent by the House. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you. Good to see you. Good to see you, Senator Waters. Um, so the open seasons that we have are set by the uh, director of fishing game, right? That is correct. And um, you know, I was on fishing game in the house and been interested in working with it for a long time. And um, you know, isn't it an important thing to have the authority vested in the director to set seasons? Thank you so very much for the question. So as you, as you heard from Ms. Snyder, um, this became a political topic for the fish and game. So what happened was, again, somebody went to fish and game and asked for a shortening of the season. Uh, it was an animal rights activist group that did it. And then fish and game decided to say no. And so then they decided to bring it over to the house for a bill to shorten the season because they didn't like the answer of fish and game. In my conversations with fish and game, it was clear that this did become a political football, for lack of a better phrase, was that it was difficult for them to to not take sides, so to speak. And it wasn't even necessarily about biology. It was about if they vote to shorten, they're going to have the hunters mad at them. If they voted to, to lengthen, they were going to have the activists mad at them. So we have broad political shoulders. We can take this on. So the idea was that as legislators, we could take this weight off Fish and Game, our commission, let them focus on true wildlife management, not the political hot potato that this has become. Yeah, and I, I, we could ask Fish and Game to still here, but I don't, we didn't hear any requests for help from them um, in their testimony. Uh, also, you know, just, I, I'm sure you've, you know, we're, we're fair to say you probably have looked back into the mists of time and Fish and Game legislation because of your role as a chair, but you know, if you do go back into the 1870s and 80s when the Fish and Game Department was set up, it was you know, very much in a response to the issues that um, were caused by legislative rulings on, um, on seasons. So, I mean, you're aware. I mean, you, you understand why I, I would have some anxieties about- I absolutely understand, Senator. On, on this case, yeah. I absolutely understand, Senator. Again, you know, it was interesting listening to Mr. Bergeron. We talk about red squirrels. There's absolutely nothing done to manage the, the population of red squirrels or anything else. We have a complete open season, and, and yet for some reason we carved out gray squirrels as a separate uh, entity to, to manage. And yet even that, it sounds like we don't do anything to really manage them. The only thing we do is restrict the season for a period of time. Senator Gatto with a question, and we're going to... Close it after. Uh, okay, Senator Gray. Yeah. Okay, we can do that after the hearing. No, we're still in the middle. Okay. Well, while they're arguing, <laughs> Senator Gray, <laughs> I, it seems to me that there's middle ground here. I mean, that if the squirrels are being a pest, that if we modify the statute to either allow the the person uh, to take pictures of the damage. You know, send that to Fish and Game says, you know, or some method of saying, okay, you know, this is the thing and not shoot them, but, you know, trap them. And then whether the law says, yeah, you can kill them by some means or relocate. I mean, it just seems to be that there's some middle ground here that, you know, Representative Pearl can, can save his uh, maple trees and his squash. Um, could you comment on that? Thank you, Senator, for the question. So again, the, the, the problem comes around to the amount of effort that Fish and Game has to do in order to justify the significant damage. So again, without a full-blown open season, it would require Fish and Game a significant amount of effort to prove, again, that substantial damage claim, which requires either a local law enforcement officer to go over and you know investigate whether or not the squirrel caused enough damage to justify its its uh, shooting. Um, I, I, you know, again, I, I, all the testimony we heard was, was uh, again, around them being pest animals. And, and again, it's the only rodent other than the beaver that we actually manage. Follow up? Yeah. And part of what you said is exactly to my point, is that if a person's taking a picture, has to, you know, go to fish and game and say, okay, this is the damage and I intend to, you know, start trapping them. If fish and game has... That would put pressure on fishing game to open the season up, to make it larger, okay? But again, it's at least some middle ground, you know, could it be that, you know, we ITL this one and then work on a bill next year that, that does something like that? 
Thank you, Senator. Again, that, that wouldn't be my preference. I'd let, prefer you OTP the bill as written and presented to the committee. Senator Gatter with a question. Yeah, again, my question would be for Fish and Game. Why is there open season year-round on reds and not on grays? There's got to be some justification for that. I would have to go back and, and see historically why. Um, All right, so, so is there a scientific reason? You need to come up and address it. I don't know. I don't have the answer right now. I'd have to go back and see historically why those those differentiations were made. Um, typically, it has to do with um, hunting pressure. So things like porcupine, um, skunks, so other. You don't know. I, I don't know exactly why there isn't on gray squirrel and there is on, or uh, there is on gray and there's not on reds. My guess would be it probably has something to do with hunting pressure. Um, we don't do guesses here. Yeah. <laughs> but if I may. It wouldn't, it be, wouldn't it be fair to say that the practice of the Fish and Game Department, when it sets seasons and does hunting surveys and, and population surveys, is science-based? Yes, that would be that would be a fair assessment. Uh, if if I can, I have a point of clarification. Sure. Um, uh, so, uh, under the RSA, it is true that you have to prove actual, or you have to. There has to be actual and substantial damage before you take an animal. Um, our FIS rules in our 300 sections. Um, that is where I would suggest we, we address these damage issues because um, we can issue permits through that section and we do for deer, we do for bear, we do for a number of other things and that allows other people opposed to the landowner to take the animals and it allows the animals to be taken just when they're in the area. They don't have to be in the act of doing damage. If you can show that you've had damage, um, we can allow additional opportunity to take and it can be, um, you don't have to prove that the damage is actually occurring at the time and it allows other people to do the harvesting. Thank you for your testimony. Thank you. Seeing no further questions, we're going to close the hearing. Yeah. Open up the hearing for HB 1049. We have three more bills, and we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine bills to exec. And we have two hours to do it. <laughs> Representative Al Aaron Reed in support, not here. Representative Peter Bixby, I'm going to, who's going to introduce the bill? Representative Aaron? I think Bixby's out there. All right, so would somebody like to introduce this bill? Senator, Senator Gray, you're recognized. Mr. Chair, I would like to uh, introduce House Bill 1049, Establishing Committee to Study Landfill Siting Criteria and Methods for Reduction of uh, Reducing uh, Pressure on Landfill Capacity. Any questions from the committee? Thank you. All right. Uh, I'm going to, because we are short on time. I had signed up to. I'm, all right. Let's okay. get going. Uh, so I, I can. Uh, give you a very quick uh, version of this. Um, so for the record, I'm uh, Representative Peter Bixby, uh, Stratford 17, House A&E. And this study committee is basically designed to look at uh, landfill siting criteria to see if anything needs to be adjusted and to look at um, ways of uh, uh, diverting more material from landfills. We got several bills in our committee uh, that were on similar topics and we rolled those into it so, because they were related. Uh, it's a very straightforward study and we hope you support it. If you have any questions, uh, you can either ask, well, I actually need to be upstairs in a couple of minutes and it sounds like you're busy. So um, if you have fast questions, ask them otherwise. <laughs> Are there any fast questions from the committee? Seeing none, All thank right. you, Representative. Thank you. Representative Pearl. Good morning again. <clears throat> Excuse me. Good morning again, Mr. Chairman and members of the ENR Committee. For the record, my name is Representative Howard Pearl. I am here to speak in favor of House Bill 1049. I know Representative Bixby gave you a quick rundown, but I, the committee uh, did a lot of work on this bill and combined about six different bills into it. The, the uh, topics are all solid waste related. and. We felt that they uh, deserved to have the time to be studied properly. So um, 
I would ask you and encourage you to support House Bill 1049. And I have a couple of more minutes than he does. So if you have any not quite so quick questions, I can probably take them. <laughs> Thank you for your testimony. Chris, questions from the committee? Yes. Senator Waters. Thank you, Representative. And you're probably aware, I just want to get in the hearing record, that um, there, there's an interest in adding in line 27 solar panels um, as one of the topics to be discussed because we had early legislation about that, which wasn't quite ready to go, but I think the sponsor of that bill thought this would be a good place for that, and I hope you'd agree with that. Oh, thank you. That would be under the extended producer responsibility, is that yeah, correct? Line 27 after batteries and certain solar panels. Okay. I can't imagine that the committee would have any um, any concern with that, but uh, certainly appreciate the heads up. Thank you. Thank you for your Senator Gray. Gray. Um, aren't a lot of these duties uh, also contained in the working group on uh, solid waste working group? Certainly, there's uh, some similarities between the two. Yes, that's we're, we're having solar. discussions of Including similar topics. Solar panels. <laughs> I don't recall solar panels specifically, but um, it could be in one of the uh, the study the uh, study committees that are occurring, or the the sub working groups that are committed. It, it wasn't in the one that I was in specifically. Thank you. Seeing no further questions, thank you very much. Thank you all. Have a great day. And I have nobody else to speak on this, so we're going to close the hearing on HB 1049. And I'll open up the hearing for HB 1293. Here from the prime sponsor, Rep. Uh, Conkey? That's correct, sir. You have the floor, sir. Thank you. Chairman, uh, esteemed members of Senate, uh, my name is uh, Mark McConkey. I, I come from Freedom, represent the good people of Carroll 3. I've had the pleasure of serving this House for 16 years, in the House for 16 years, of which all time I've spent in public works and highways. I've been chair, I've been vice chair, and presently vice chair. In my personal uh, life, my job, I'm a septic designer, installer, do a, a lot of permitting uh, in a family business. Uh, 1293 that's before you uh, was brought to me by the department and I have uh, Manager Throwbridge here and Rob Tarda from Subsurface to answer more in-depth questions um, to uh, remove an item that's been in the regulations for uh, since the beginning, I believe, of uh, subsurface, permitting homeowners to be their own designers. Um, I'll be quick. Uh, back in the 70s when this started, uh, a person had to determine the seasonal high water table and they could be, they had to be four feet above that seasonal high water. Technology has marched on and most of the systems we design these days are, are at only two foot for above seasonal high water. Uh, so there's no, there's nowhere near as much error anymore on determining where a bed should go. And the department uh, has all designers go through a two-part permitting process. Uh, one is to know the rules and regulations. The second is to ensure that we know uh, soils so when we call uh, for the placement, uh, we know we're protecting the environment. Uh, they, the department... Uh, is spending, there aren't all that many that are coming in, but they are spending an awful lot of time on this process and it is their hope that we could just remove this and it would still allow uh, installers, uh, homeowners using the same regulation to installers. So it's, it's just one item. That is, uh, that is the first. Working with the department, there were two housekeeping measures and I apologize for the lateness of bringing amendments before your They've been rushing like a charrette on a cart going down the street to get this prepared for you. And um, those, are, those are here, um, one of which uh, addresses well radiuses. And the other is the timeliness of um, uh, approving uh, applications before their department. So I'm, I'm happy to answer on the, um, on the main, and I'm hoping that um, you gentlemen, if you would, uh, and madam, um, are so inclined uh, to listen to the department on, uh, on the amendments. That's your call, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Do you have uh, any comments extra on the amendments that you want? To... Uh, on, the, on the two amendments? The, um, 
the one that's dear to my heart is is the um, well radius adjusting the well radius regulations. Um, and if you had a well that was prior to uh, 1987, I believe is the year, uh, you you uh, placed your well near the edge of your property, uh, 10 foot off. You had the right to restrict development 75 feet around your well radius uh, to ensure because an interpretation uh, that the department will say may have been incorrectly applied uh, created issues for uh, the homeowner next door when it was time to buy that lot. There was a process to go through an encroachment waiver where I had to approach you and I had to say, would you give me permission to be in that location? And being a professional that has done hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of these applications, I have uh, rarely, if ever, received a encroachment waiver from a neighbor, especially if there was some bickering back and forth. So I think, again, science is on the side. I think there's a better process for it. And uh, the second issue on the permitting, the Department of Environmental Services, I praise up and down the street every day. They're quick in review. We turn in plans. There's a list of what we need to do. They typically turn a plan around in a couple days, uh, one day, many times. I believe their issue is on subdivision regulations, and uh, the issue hasn't come to the forefront until now that someone's saying that you need to approve our, our uh, application before you in 14 or 15 days, and if you don't, it's considered approved, and, and that's an issue. They would like the ability to be able to to be able to request more information if necessary. Thank you, Representative. Uh, Senator Perkins spoke with a question. Yeah, thank you very much, Chairman. Um, I, I think this all makes sense. Uh, just a couple questions to try to clarify um, and understand. So uh, Section 2G says any portion of a protected well radius that is not maintained on lot shall not be deemed to have protection and therefore a sewage disposal system shall not be required to meet the setback distance to wells on abutting lots. Um, I'm sorry, I'm reading from um, what Rennie sent to us. I This is Amendment 1785H. Um, this would occur um, on page two, lines 32 through 34. I'm sorry, Senator, I got it. I was reading from the Word document. Um, and then if we continue to section 3B, so lines um, 5 through 13 on page 3, you know, it talks about the encroachment waiver, I guess just as somebody new to this. Um, you know, combined with eliminating the notification of a new sewage disposal system, I just, I'm concerned there's a gap if someone was installing a new sewage disposal system within an abutting neighbor's well radius, but is the practice that um, if you don't um, have legal ownership over the entire well radius, then so you're sort of on your own, or maybe you could just speak to that a little I, bit. I, I, Sandra, I, a, a great question. I would like to defer to the department for the answer on that. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Moran. And so, with that, that, we'll ask the department to come up. Philip? Can you talk about the bill or both the amendments either way? Sorry. <laughs> you're, the, you're, you're the only speaker on this. So. Is that what you think about? <laughs> no. uh, okay. Um, so. you got the floor. Great. Uh, good morning, uh, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. Um, for the record, my name is Philip Trowbridge. I'm the manager of the Land Resource Management Programs at DES. And one of those programs is the Subsurface Systems Bureau, which is relevant to this bill. Um, so um, Representative Conkey did a great job introducing the bill. I won't go into a lot of detail. There are really three pieces here. There's the original bill text regarding the homeowner uh, designs 
then there's the two amendments. So perhaps what I'll do is just talk about each of those three pieces in turn, and we can pause for any questions. All right, start on the first bill. Um, yes, please. Um, so as you know, the effect of this bill would be to remove the authority for a homeowner to design their own septic system. Um, this provision is rarely used. Uh, it occurs maybe 10 times a year out of the 6,000 applications that we process. Um, but uh, unfortunately, when it does occur, it normally causes some problems. Um, uh, first off, you know, these applications take a disproportionate amount of time to handle. There's often, um, you know, many back and forths to make them approvable, and uh, we're, we're trying to serve thousands of people each year, so this takes time away from uh, that. Um, also, as Representative McConkey mentioned, the septic system design depends on good knowledge of soils and the depth of the groundwater. Um, licensed designers, like Representative McConkey, are trained and certified in these areas. Uh, it's absolutely critical that a septic system not be designed too low and in the groundwater because it will pollute the groundwater of the homeowner's property as well as their neighbor's properties um, and uh, you know, also surface waters of nearby. Um, and any system installed that way would be deemed in failure automatically, so it would be uh, of no use. Uh, so therefore, the department supports uh, the bill as written. Questions from the committee? Uh, right on. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Phil, for your testimony. So, do you have any data on the financial capacity of people who seek to do their own installations? My concern being, mm -hmm. if we don't have such a provision that people not have the ability to pay for a system design and installation, yeah. might allow a failed system to continue or might try to do it anyway because they don't have the means. Is there any provision to address that issue? Um, thank you for the question. I'd say there's actually one aspect I need to clarify is we're talking right now about just the design aspect of yeah. this. Uh, there still is a provision for a homeowner to do the own, their own installation, which tends to be the more expensive part of installing or replacing a septic system. So what we're only removing is you know, the cost of the design, which is normally around $1,000. Know. Which, if I may, is, is more than a little bit for some families that are, that are not, uh, you know, not, not better off financially. So okay. my concern is we're going to defeat the purpose of this yeah. by those few people yeah. saying, okay, I can't do it. I'm going to do something else anyway. Mm -hmm. No, understood. I think for context, you know, the, the actual, you know, installation work, the construction work is normally in the tens of thousands of dollars. Um, so, you know, being able to do that yourself is still a financial benefit if you have the equipment and you actually are the, the homeowner. Um, and we run into some challenges, you know, I'm going a little bit off topic. We run into some challenges where people are doing this work claiming to be the homeowner when they really aren't. Um, so we're already having trouble with even that aspect of it. But in an interest of, like you mentioned, of you know, recognizing that some people may have the equipment and may have the ability and, and want to keep costs down, we've kept that aspect of the, uh, the homeowner installation part, um, just recognizing we, they need professional help to actually design it properly. Right. And I don't think that you've necessarily addressed my concern, which is indigent folks probably are the ones that are putting in the self-design. They're not up to standards. Yeah. And they can't afford to have a designer do it. $1,000 to some people is a lot of money, and it's getting a lot more money these days. Yeah. So my concern being, are we going to defeat the very purpose of this? Is there some way we can you know, uh, provide some kind of a, a service for people that want to do it themselves but can't afford to hire? Uh, but people that want to do it but can't afford to hire uh, a contractor for $1,000 to do a design. Well, I'd say that there is one thing that we are become, become aware of, because we deal with this just in general with failed septic systems, and, and people want to do the right thing, but they don't have the money to do it. Um, there's some funding that's available through uh, the rural development, which is part of the U.S. Department of Agriculture, which is what we've been referring people to. And if you meet uh, income thresholds, uh, in, in sort of a means testing approach, um, it covers 90% of the work. So Okay, thank you. You've answered my question. So this wouldn't undermine that? Right. No. Okay. Senator Waters. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And so I, I think I heard you correctly that um, if somebody designs their own mm -hmm. and they've designed it poorly and then they install it on there by themselves, you will shut it down. Um, if we become aware of it, it becomes yeah. in failure. Yes. Mm -hmm. Thank you. All right. Uh, next, if you want to talk, oh, Senator Gray. 
Oh, uh, yeah. In your testimony, you said you support the bill as written. Huh. I've got two amendments. Yeah. As written to me is the base bill, not the uh, amendments. Oh. That's what we're talking about. We, uh, apologies for the confusion there. We, we support both, but I, I was just speaking in particular about the base bill. But you do support both the amendments? Correct. Well, if, just for clarification, you, you said you were going to walk us through first the base bill and mm -hmm. then each amendment. So yeah. it, this is the first page of your testimony? Correct. So I'm going to start this person. I believe my question is on the amendment, so I will wait. Thank All right. you. So uh, if you want to walk us through the, the First Amendment. Yes, please. Um, so the, this First Amendment to the bill deals with how to, uh, to manage. Sorry. The number of the amendment, so we know which one you're talking about. We're talking about the, the amendment 2022-1785-H. You have this one. Okay. Um, so this amendment deals with how to manage the placement of septic systems relative to Driving drinking water, private drinking water wells on same or abutting lots. And Representative McConkie already described some of this issue. Um, so for background, you know, the, the drinking water well, for a drinking water well, there's a protected well radius within, within which certain activities are prohibited or precluded. And for a typical drinking water well, this is a 75 foot radius. Um, and sometimes this radius cannot be contained wholly on the lot owned by the landowner, and it extends off the lot, um, which um, it can create expectation of controlling the development on the neighbor's lot. And uh, the, um, the Supreme Court ruled in the 1990s that this uh, could not occur, that, um, that any portion of the well radius on, another butter's, on a butter's property could not um, protect, prevent that abutter from fully utilizing their land. And following that decision, as you installed wells where this was the case, um, the owner had to sign this well release and record that with the deed of their property, uh, basically releasing them of any <coughs> protection on the abutter, you know, for the well radius that's on the abutter's land. Uh, the RSA that deals with this, which is RSA 45A30B, you know, tried to take the situation to, into account. Um, it created two tiers of wells, you know, wells that were installed before the Supreme Court decision, and, which didn't have a well release signed, and wells that were installed afterwards. Um, it required well releases to be signed for any of the new wells, uh, and it required this encroachment waiver uh, when a septic system would be installed inside the radius of, but on an abutting property, to one of the pre-court decision wells. Just describing it, you can see how it's a kind of a convoluted and complicated situation. Uh, in practice, this approach proves to be really challenging to implement um, without much environmental gain. Um, at first, it was just confusing to have these two tiers of wells. Um, second, there's no real additional protection to the pre-court decision wells because of the legal decision by the court. Uh, and third, uh, the encroachment waivers were recorded on the wrong property. Uh, they were recorded on the property with the septic system and not the property with the well. So if someone was interested in purchasing the property with the well, they'd have no information about, you know, that there was an encroachment waiver. They'd have to search on the abutting property. So this approach, proposed amendment um, would, uh, it looks like a lot of changes because we did uh, some rewriting of section 30B and 30A to make it clearer, uh, but there's relatively few substantive changes. Um, first, it removes the two tiers of wells, treats them all the same. It removes the requirement for the encroachment waiver because that really wasn't doing much. And then it adds a requirement to record a document uh, with a deed uh, when the protected well radius is not met for a well and septic system on the same lot. And this is an area that we're just trying to kind of level the playing field because you had this well release for the, you know, the, the property was, uh, where the radius goes off lot. But you didn't have a similar thing where if, the, if there was a, you know, encroachment on the um, radius on the same lot that would tell a prospective buyer what was going on. Um, on page two, line G, oh. Senator Perkins spoke, I had a, um, uh, there's a page, uh, line 32, mm -hmm. uh, section G, 
Okay. Right, you had a question with regard to yeah, you want to rephrase that? Well, I think you're largely answering it. Thank you, Chair. Um, I, I guess now with the information you've provided, um, my question is pretty limited. Um, and what I was asking about previously was making sure that if you were installing a new sewage disposal system that an abutting lot on which was located an existing well mm -hmm. would have at minimum some kind of notification. Mm -hmm. But um, I'm sort of hearing through your testimony and the previous testimony that if, you're, if your well radius extends off of property over which you have control, legal right. control, that you're, you're sort of, you're yeah. waiving that protection. Yes, and you're what, absolutely right. Okay, and what you guys are doing in new 3B is you're essentially requiring that when the owner installing the sewage disposal system installs it, that they record a waiver. Mm -hmm. Yep. So on the same lot, yeah. So yeah. like you've got a, a lot and you've got your own, your well radius is entirely on the lot. And yep. for whatever reason, you're not able to locate the set the sewage disposal system outside of that. Yeah. And there's site constraints that sure. make that happen. And then you would get, there's be, right now, the practice would be just to give you a waiver on your septic system approval. Yeah. Which is just a part of the septic system approval, but it's not really easily discoverable to a, a future buyer of Correct. the property. Right. So we're okay. saying we'd like you to record that yeah. with the deed. So it's kind of similar so that it's an apples to apples thing. If, you know, a future, you know, purchaser knows if the well radius has is been compromised, basically, and they can, um, you know, go into the the transaction eyes wide open. Yeah. Okay. I, that, thank Senator Guido, with a question. So, by allowing the construction of a septic system within the protected well radius, mm -hmm. are we endangering health? Mm. Uh, no, no, sir. Uh, the uh, there's things called special methods of construction, which we uh, put into place in those cases where you know, it's increased casing, which basically, uh, if you can imagine this in a three-dimensional way, if the 75-foot setback is horizontal and we can't meet that, you can still meet that diagonally by adding extra you know, casing going vertically you know, down the, sh the well. So we um, use that to protect public health in this case. Follow up. So is there any for lack of a bit, hydrogeological research done on the efficacy of this slant range versus the direct distance? Uh, um, I would just say that it's, uh, in, in all cases, the, the land, the, the distance for which the water has to travel through soil is the treatment, and it doesn't matter if it's horizontal or vertical or diagonal. Thank you. Senator Waters with a question. Thank you. Um, this certainly looks familiar from a case that we had in Barrington a few years ago. Um, so I just had two quick questions. Um, you know, obviously, there's nothing that's retroactive about this, right? Correct. And then secondly, if a, if a system was installed uh, previously, mm -hmm. before this came into effect, mm -hmm. um, then if there was a desire to expand or change the current system that that would be allowed here, as I understand it. Um, like a, like the okay. sewage disposal systems increased? Like I mean, something had to be altered or a, a, a well. If there's a new action that needs to be taken, like let's say a well has to be re-drilled, yeah. um, um, then you know it would be processed under the, the, new, the new rules. All right, thank you. Further questions? All right, let's go to the next uh, amendment. Okay, and apologies that there's so much to cover here. And uh, also apologies, I don't have a copy of the official other amendments, so I don't know the number. Thank you. Uh, so this, the, these are our comments relative to the amendment uh, 2022-1781-H. Um, this amendment deals with the process of reviewing and approving applications for septic system and subdivision of land. Uh, the statute, in this case, RSA 45A31, uh, requires DES to either approve or disapprove applications within set time frames. Um, uh, we've been able to function under this st statute um, 
fine for, for many years. Uh, it's just been brought to our attention recently that um, we should uh, seek some clarification regarding requests for more information. Uh, because often applications to us, particularly for subdivision of land, we are complicated and require some time for a request for more information back and forth. And, and that's not specifically provided in, in this part of the statute. So uh, what this uh, amendment would do would add in an explicit step for the request for more information and set uh, time frames for the department to respond. Um, and we support this because uh, it gives the departments and applicants clarity on the process, it helps applicants improve their application, and uh, gives us all more options for time extensions should they be needed. Any further questions? Yes. Just one quick question. It, it seems that what's contemplated here is essentially one back and forth. The application is submitted, you request further information, and then mm. you act. Correct. The intent. Okay. I, thank you. That's yes. what I was hoping you were going to say. So. Seeing no further questions, thank you very much for your testimony. We're going to close, close the hearing on this and open up the hearing to HB 1205. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Representative Puddock. Yeah, I only have one speaker on this next bill. Uh, and uh, Representative Puddock is not here. So, would somebody like to? 1205? Go for it. It's your job now. Uh, Mr. Chair, I'd like to introduce House Bill 1205, along with the Department of Environmental Services to have access to enhanced 911 information. <coughs> Any questions from the committee? Well done. <laughs> All right, so I have one speaker on this bill, uh, Brandon Kernan, New Hampshire Department of DES. Welcome. You're our first and our last speaker. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman <coughs> and members of the committee. I'm Brandon Kernan. I'm the administrator of the Drinking Water and Groundwater Bureau at DES. Um, we're here to testify in support of this bill mm -hmm. um, today. Um, currently, state law allows DES to have limited access to the E911 data. Essentially, we have access to the longitude, latitude, and street address. And per a law that was passed in 2006 um, based on a recommendation of a legislative groundwater commission, we got access um, to that limited aspect of E911 so that we could locate wells. Um, when well drillers um, submit reports to us, there's an address on it, and we can match that address with the longitude, latitude, and dot, and thus have you know, a geolocation for the wells. Also, when there's um, contamination events in the state, and there's been a lot of that with the PFAS lately, especially in southern New Hampshire, we've been able to use that data to figure out where there are private wells. And we do that by looking at the dots on the map from the E911, and we have the map water lines for the community water systems, and where you have an address, which indicates there's a, a likely a structure, um, and no water line, you can infer there's a private well. And thus, when there's contamination, we've been able to identify where there are wells that need to be sampled and where homeowners uh, need to be notified. So it's been really useful since 2006 in protecting public health to have that limited access. Um, a key component of House Bill 1205 is that it would enable DES to use the same data set, again, just the longitude, latitude, and the address, to maintain an inventory of lead service lines. Um, there's a federal regulation that's come down that requires that by October 2024 that we have an inventory of all service lines that go to customers of public water systems. And so for each address, we're going to have to indicate what type of line is going to that structure. Is it lead? Is it galvanized? And letting us use this data set gives us a perfect set of addresses to start with. You know, naming convention, accuracy, we know they're there. And it would uh, really streamline this federal requirement. And it's, you know, ultimately, we're going to have like 800,000 um, know, service lines that we have to identify the pipe type for. And ultimately, that data is then going to be used to require a lead service line replacement um, over the next many years. And there's a lot of federal funding that's come down from the infrastructure bill to help with that. 
Uh, so for those reasons, um, we support this bill, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you for your testimony. Questions from the committee, Senator Geider. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, do you know exactly what information is contained in E911 that you would want, or would you have access to all of it? Two questions. I know exactly what we have, and, we, and we're not asking for any expanded access. We essentially have a longitude, latitude, um, and an address. So uh, and if, it, if you look at the second page of the letter that I handed out, it's essentially we can produce that type of map, a bunch of dots, and then we would be adding the pipe type to it. So no personally identifiable data? There's no names at all on Thank our you. map. Thank uh, you. There were four votes against it in the House. Do you know what that was? What, what the objection was? What I recall hearing is that when 911, the E911 was established in the 90s, it was promised that it would only be used for law enforcement, and that you know here we are 30 years later, and some felt like it was breaking a promise from when the bill was adopted back in the 90s that it was being used for another purpose, and so it was sort of that that philosophical reason. Other questions, Senator Perkins Boca. So, just to be completely clear, you ex you have existing access to this data. What you are asking for, in addition to the wells, is essentially the the pipeline system. Yes, this, right now we can only use the data to locate wells, and we want to use the data that we have to also put the pipe type with the property. Um, we don't we're not authorized to do that right now. Okay. Senator, Senator Waters, you have questions? We're good. Senator Geider. And that's only for public water systems? That's, cor that's correct. They're the ones that have to do the lead service line inventory. Thank you. Any further questions? Seeing none, thank you for your testimony. We're going to close the hearing on that. I'll take a motion for exec. Senator Gray and Senator Waters. All in favor say aye. 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 Let's take up this one that we just heard, 1205. Is there a motion? Uh, to pass. Second. Second. Hold, please. Hold, please. Senator Perkins Cuoco moves ought to pass on 1205. Yeah, I'm a, I'm, I hear her. And Senator Waters seconded it. And further discussion? All in favor of ought to pass? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Seeing none. Consent. Second. Consent. Senator. Uh, Waters, second by Sen Senator Perkins Cuoco. All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Seeing I'm none. happy to take this Senator out. Senator Perkins Cuoco gets to take this one out. I would like to do um, 490. Get this one over. Chairman, I have reviewed both amendments for 490, and I think we just, um, there's a couple lines we want to insert still as a committee amendment. Okay. So is there a motion first on the bill? Yeah, I'll move on to pass for discussion purposes. And second by Second Senator Waters. Waters. Okay, discussion. Um, so I believe, I see that we've prepared um, amendments 1776 and 1777, and I believe it was the intent of the committee to include I'm not sure the easiest way to reference this, but um, from Amendment 1429, I think we wanted to retain lines 16 through 27. Um, I'm missing some amendments here. Okay. Which amendment? So which one are we on? So for both 1776 and for 1777, whichever one oh. we decide to act on. It's the same yeah. correction. All right. Is that yours? And then that's what Senator Brown did. Okay. So uh, 1776 is exclusive to Senator Guida. 1777 has my amendment with the uh, with the gun thing. Correct. Right. So, um, but you're so just, your, your comments are regarding... Apply to either, so let's just take 1776 for discussion purposes. Okay. Um, I think that after line 20, um, it was our intent to retain from the amendment we considered yesterday, which was 1429S, I think we wanted to retain 
lines 16 through 27. But it, I'm not, I know that's a confusing way to reference it. I'm just trying to. So on uh, line 16 through 20. Is that a drafted amendment we see? See if there's an easier way to reference it. It was the one we talked about yesterday. So or I can refer to the version of the bill as amended by the House for this, this is, language either. These way. are the same, no, except my I know, but yeah. she's referring to one we had yesterday. I don't know what it is. It is well, if I may, there there was yep, a discussion please. that we had yesterday. <laughs> and the discussion that we had centered around amendment fourteen twenty nine S. That's what I'm trying to do. And we were going to take out on line nine, starting with the A, uh, all the way down to uh, line 12, take out B and after December 31st. I think that's it. Right? Which we did. And take out the words after the date. Right. Yep. Which we did. Insert between lines 15 and 16. Roman 3 and Roman 4 of the bill as amended on page 2 at the top, which is of the bill as amended is lines 1 through 4. Which we did. And then renumber sections 3 and Roman 3 and Roman 4 of the amendment to Five. Um, Five. accommodate that change. Okay, so that's what we talked about yesterday. Right. And right. so what I um, am attempting to verbally explain is that I do not believe sections five and six are in today's amendment. Ms. Johnson, I'm just hoping that the Senate House amendment is on this one. <laughs> she's talking about 1776. But it, the same comment applies to 17. I want my amendment. <laughs> 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 yeah. They're the same. Yeah. So do we need to make a correction to this one? I think we do. So let's work off of 1777. Okay. And exactly what do we need to do? Is it easier for me to refer to the bill then? Yep. Okay. Then I believe what we want to do to move a committee amendment is to take 1777 and insert after line 21 um, the sections 5 and 6 which appear on page 2 of the bill as amended by the House. So yep. Daly, you got that? Lines 5 through 16. Lines 5 through 16 be added after line 21 on the 1777 amendment. Page 2, lines 5 through 16. 5 through 16 will be added after line 21 on 1777. So if you wouldn't mind repeating that for me, Daly. After, after 21. 21. Senator Gray, you think that covers the numbering as well? I do. I think it works. And then on line 24, on line 24, Roman 5 becomes Roman uh, 7. Of the amendment? Yes. yes. Okay. Of this. All right, and uh, two of seven that should uh, right take care of it. I'm uh, not. I'm not sure because um, doesn't doesn't line twenty four isn't that from RSA two of seven thirty six? Excuse me, no, forget that. That was my mistake because we're in a different section there. So no, it's we don't need to do that okay. on line twenty four. Strike okay. that, so, Mr. Chairman. I move as a committee amendment. Uh, 
your amendment 1777 with the corrections or the additions just made. Is there a second? Um, before I would second that, we at least ought to have a discussion on the page two. Sure. Of the amendment. Yeah, um, so if I just say, I mean, Attorney Guard, you know, it's your bill, but I, I did check out this in the federal statute and uh, on line 12. Yeah, and it seems to be the federal language that referred to starter pistols and other other things. So, Senator, do you want to talk about it? Yeah, you're the only senator sitting in the room, former senator, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you. For the record, Bob Robert Clegg, um, and I'm not here as a lobbyist, but I do. Rep I do. Uh, I am the president of Program New Hampshire. What happened was there was a court case where a judge, in in many opinions, overstepped um, the definition of firearm. Felons have always been able to, or people with felonies, and I'm not talking about murderers, have always been able to hunt with black powder pistols and black powder rifles. Um, it's very difficult to hunt with, as you know. And someone got caught with a black powder pistol, and the judge decided that our language and our law wasn't clear enough, so he charged them as being a felon in possession of a firearm. If we put this government's, the federal government's definition in, um, we'll resolve that issue. There's nothing we can do for the person who's already gotten caught, but there's a whole lot of people out there who think that it's still okay to hunt with a black powder rifle or a black powder pistol. And according to that judge, um, a lot of people are going to get arrested and, and be in deep doo doo. Senator Gray, you have a question? No, I wanted a discussion held on that because it, it is uh, the non germane amendment. And uh, again, I just want to make sure it gets vetted. Yep. Senator Perkins Corker. Are there additional safety concerns with black powder pistols? The only safety with black powder pistols is the person who's loading it better be careful when he's loading it or he's yeah, going to get hurt. I've had a lot of experience with these. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's, it's, not, it's not the hunting weapon of, of choice for a lot of people, but um, it, it is a definite challenge. Especially if you have a, a wet cap. And that's traditional. You know, I mean, it's a lot of tradition. There's a lot of antique firearms out there. So. Any further discussion? Speaker in support. Yes, I'm, I'm in support, definitely in support. All right, thank you. Appreciate thank you. Your testimony. Um, with that, so is there a second? I'll second it. Okay. All in favor of the amendment as committee amendment? Uh, Can I just make one quick comment, which is I, I do support um, adding this consent requirement that is contained in this amendment. So I'll be voting for the amendment. I, I don't feel fully informed as to the change on page two, but I want to support the consent um, on page one, so I'll be voting for it. Thank you. Thank you. So all in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed, seeing none. Is there a motion to move as, as amended to move the whole bill, or do we just do that? No, um, we need to do that. So maybe we need a motion. I ought to pass those amendments. Thank you. Second. Discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Seeing none. Is there a motion for consent? Yes. <laughs> Would you like to take it out? <laughs> All right. I'm going to take it out. I just think that the non germane amendment should be reserved. Yeah, I should. Yeah, I should. Uh, yeah. That's fine. Yeah. All right, we'll do it. We'll and, take it out. I'll and take it out. Colleagues, um, Senator Regard's um, Senator got a good work on this. This is, a, this is a thorny one, and I think we got to a good place, so thank you. Thank you. All right. <laughs> I'm taking that out. I'm being bullied. <laughs> All right. I guess this is throw away right now. I can be disclosed on that choice. All right. So, uh, 1293? Where is that? <clears throat>
the one we did just now with the um, sewage disposal system. Didn't we just vote on that one? We did 12.05. That was 12, uh, oh, 1293, okay. 1293, is there a motion on 1293? Move out to pass. Second. And I'll move as a committee amendment both the amendments that were presented Second. to us from DES. Further discussion? All in favor of the committee amendments? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Seeing none. We want to pass as amended. Second. Further discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Seeing consent. Is there a second on consent? Second. Discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. <laughs> Any opposed? Seeing none. I'll take it out if you want. Or Who? You want? Yeah. All right. Well, so, I don't how does it take so it Or somebody else if you'd like to. Make me take it out. Yes. Both of them. 1776 and 7785. Well, that's the other one. All right. All right. So, I had an amendment for uh, 1131. I mean, 1331. Yeah. Um, so, first of all, uh, is there a motion on 1331? And then I'll offer a motion. Uh, let me get to it. This bill allows New Hampshire utility customers that requires power lines extensive located in private property to hire a contractor who is approved by the utility. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah okay. Yeah. So, housekeeping. Senator Waters opposes. And then. Second. Seconded by Senator Perkins Polka. I have an amendment from uh, Senator Daniels. Uh, it is a 1751S, and it amends the title of the bill by replacing it with uh, relative to power lines maintenance and construction and relative definitions of public utilities. Uh, there's just a, a small change on line 10, which removes the word exempt and the uh, word shall not, which will make it enabling language. Uh, and this basically, uh, Restores local control on telecommunication cellular towers. Uh, towers. So um, I just had a question, Chair. Yep. There's there's a definition of public utility in 362 mm -hmm. two as well. Well, they're both kind of definitions. Um, so it, I mean, is the intent here? To restore local control over. Yeah. Sure, I'm just going to throw them out the same time. Senator, Senator Daniels. Yep. Yeah, I understand that. Yep. I got the question out there. So right. we have a number of people that I'm aware of that have privately put up towers on their own property on which cell antennas and, and apparatus are, are mounted. Are we then going to consider them under this to be a public utility? Does it include any individual? And, um, and you know what? I could have Senator Daniels come. Yeah, come. Mr. Chairman. I, I, it's individuals who also own LLC for liability. And so if it's, if it's an individual uh, property right. Yeah, and, yeah. I mean, this is, I think this is also including on Jermaine. And what I'm concerned about is that I don't have a clue what this, the implications of this are. I can think immediately of a case in Dover where a farmer wanted to have one, but it was cited in a place that the city and there were some air traffic concerns about it. Uh -huh. um, and you know, I don't really know what we're doing okay. with this. And I, I, and we don't have any folks here from the department or from the company. So I, I just don't know how we legislate on this. It, and why couldn't it be done next year? Uh, so, I mean, I, I mean, I, you know, I, I understand senatorial courtesy and all that, but yeah. I, I'm just, I don't even know how to think about this. Okay. Uh, you know, what I, I can do is put it off and just maybe I have uh, Senator Daniels come if, he, if he's available. And, Maybe explain it. Maybe this is just a simple fix. Uh, I put it in form. Um, it's not simple. I mean, this is this is this is. It's not simple. Okay. It's really not simple. All right. To deal with. I just don't understand it. Yeah. Public providers. All right. Property owners and so forth. And the TUC can't can't have any jurisdiction. I don't know. I mean, what we're going to be spending a lot of public money on on broadband build out. So what's the relationship to that? 
Uh, I'm thinking maybe we send it to Danny. She can probably come the next flight now. All right, so I'm going to hold off on that. If he comes, then we'll, we'll take it back up. And there he is, right there. Uh, Look at that. As if by magic. <laughs> Poof! <laughs> <laughs> as if by magic, or telecommunications, please. Uh, I, I introduce you, Bill, uh, your, your amendment, but probably not as well as you're going to. <laughs> well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate the, the opportunity to bring to you some information and so. We're removing the word uh, exempt and, and not. Or Correct. Yeah. I'm going to just give it. <clears throat> for, the, for the record, my name is Gary Daniels. I'm a state senator from District 11, uh, encompassing the towns of Wilton, Milford, Amherst, and Merrimack. And I'd like to bring to you this morning uh, Amendment 1751S for, to House Bill 1331. And I've just given you a little bit of background information there. In RSA 362, we, d we define the uh, term public utility, and I'm not going to read it all because it is, is kind of lengthy. But then as you go on, uh, RSA 362.6 exempts uh, mobile communications services. So pursuant, pursuant to the New Hampshire... Public Utilities Commission, uh, it has no jurisdiction over mobile radio communication services. And so consequently, the state declines jurisdiction over the certification of wireless carriers as eligible telecommunication carriers, or ETCs, uh, leaving that jurisdiction authority to the FCC. Uh, what this amendment does uh, it will allow New Hampshire to reclaim its juris ju jurisdictional authority from the federal government, namely the Federal Communications Commission, to determine whether telecommunication providers licensed in the lifetime program can, can serve our citizens. Uh, the proposed legislative change allows New Hampshire's Public Utilities Commission authority to start considering and approving qualified new telecommunication providers it selects so that more eligible New Hampshireites can, aff can affordably access tele telemedicine to connect with a health care provider and or to help stay out of the emergency room, access remote learning, access 911 services, and find and keep a job. The FCC has failed to consider any new telecommunication providers to serve low-income citizens in New Hampshire for about nine years. Ten other states, and now th this year eight, including New Hampshire, still depend on the FCC to approve and oversee providers in New Hampshire. So with this, uh, with this amendment, it allows us to pull our authority back to New Hampshire and uh, once again control our own destiny in that area. Over to Guido. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Senator, thank you for this. I think this is important legislation, but I have serious concerns for, for example, uh, private individuals who have erected cell towers, either as a proprietorship or as an LLC on their own private property that are now unfunctional. That would suddenly bring them under the jurisdiction of the PUC. And that's the last place I want a, a private citizen to have to appear to possibly justify the building of a tower or something like that. Uh, that my concern is for that that segment of this population. Um, I know I'm just, that's, I just wanted to state that. I, I, I can't support this as it's presently written, but would support an initiative to amend it or perhaps to bring it back next year because we haven't heard from any of the providers or other people. Yeah, the, the, my understanding is the large providers on this, um, that there have been no opposition in the other states where this has, has passed. Uh, the, the individual thing that you talk about, um, had not been considered. So. Um,
because of my work on the Sussman Pins Board and the Commission for 5G, uh, this brings up questions about preemption, uh, federal preemption, because we're talking about cell towers. It also talks, we have a, um, a, a, you know, that certain communications equipment isn't taxed by the local communities. Uh, this would change that. I just have too many questions, you know, and only seeing this this morning um, to support it at this time. It may be, um, you know, that it's the right thing to do, but I, I just don't have the information here available to me. You know, I looked up the statute on the phone and, I'm, you know, I just can't get there in, you know, 15 minutes. Um. I, I bring this to you as a, as a request this morning uh, for your consideration, and I'll leave it to the expertise on the committee as to what to do with it. Thank you, Senator. I appreciate your uh, clarifying issues and your answering my questions. Thank you. So, with that, uh, we're still in exec and we're considering the amendment. So, let's just Bring it to a vote. I would move interim study. On the amendment? On the amendment. Well, um, let's. I think what Senator Kaiser may want to do is move off the pass on the bill without the consideration of the amendment. So the, That's the, exactly what I said. The, the, motion on the, the motion on the bill has already been uh, put forward and seconded. Uh, so right now is the question on the committee so amendment. If so nobody, if nobody moves it or seconds it, we don't consider it. All right, I, I'm going to move it, and, and if there's not a second, that's the that's the, the will of the committee. So I move this this uh, amendment, and seeing how nobody is seconding it, <laughs> okie dokie. So on the on the underlining bill, is uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Seeing none. Is that so? A question. Uh, Consent? for the minutes of the hearing report yeah. is a motion that is not seconded recorded in the hearing report uh, now it just died it just not, yeah. thank you but it is on tape hi everybody <laughs> uh, ought to pass senator perkins quokka seconded by senator waters yeah and senator waters moved consent seconded by senator perkins quokka and so Senator Waters is going to have the privilege of taking that one out. Mm -hmm. Do we vote on consent? Aye. 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 All opposed? Well, yeah, because you're taking it out. Okay. No. All right. 270, 1270. Is there a motion on 1270? We'll get there. Repealing the Oversight Committee to Monitor and Transform Delivery of Electrical Services, Representative Thomas. This is a committee that uh, outlived its uh, usage, and uh, what was brought forward in 1996 to oversee the deregulation, uh, seven members of the committee, broad scope, hasn't had a meeting since 2018. So, uh, yeah, I would move the, uh, move the bill. Move the bill. Is there a second? Second. Okay. Discussion? Um, I would note that the two members of this committee that didn't know they were on that committee <laughs> would be glad to have their workload reduced. You do remember that, huh? <laughs> All right. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Seeing none. Uh, is there a motion for consent? Okay, all in favor say aye. aye. Any opposed, seeing none. Senator Guyton, you get the privilege. It's government, yes. Senator Guyton is shrinking government today. All right, well done. <laughs> he just shrunk just by a little bit. Hopefully, the governor signs it. Uh, Senator Guyton. 1148. Uh, yes, uh, Mr. Chairman, um, I have a, an amendment. Here, let me get the copy of it. I'm sorry, it took me a second. Is that for line five and it's six? It's been drafted, but uh, yeah. I have what it would be. And um, let me, yep, yeah, here you go. Thank you, Dan. 
relative to prohibiting government entities from subordinating to so, yeah. um, I, I I found this a very and to be an interesting question raised by the bill and uh, I did ask the question just today about you know unclear about well could do municipalities even have this authority anyways and then the second question is that we you know we had mentioned a municipalities that said they want to get to certain goals on net zero or I mean on zero net zero and this and that and the other thing yada yada um, and there too you know I I'm, was curious about well if, if they have goals that doesn't mean they're going to enact anything that prohibits anybody um, and I think I voted last year for the one for, that prohibited you know that Senator Morse's bill on it but I, I thought that, um, and I talked to Josh Elliott, that, you know, why don't we ask the Department of Energy to, to tell us about whether or not municipalities have this, this authority. Now, we heard from the sponsor of the, um, of the bill that there was, we had no awareness of any case of anybody doing it or contemplating doing it, but, so I don't think it's something that, you know, is it, we we are in an emergency situation where some communities decide it's no more natural gas or something like that. Um, so I I thought this would be a way to go on it. Have, having sense that there was some anxiety about the bill, I thought that this would be the key question to get be answered. And since there was no kind of exigent circumstances, then the sponsor we get the answers and uh, and see where we want to go with it. So that's and I did put the the. Um, uh, July 1st, June 1st, 2023, after Josh Elliott suggested that they got a lot of work in front of them, they'd be happy to study this, to, to, to provide a report, could be done, but give them a little time. Josh, you want to make a comment at all? Since we're the procedure replacement. Did you say what? It's a replacement. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, just looking at it now, um, Senator Waters has mentioned we had a brief conversation yesterday regarding this. Um, I believe this is something that the department could put together. I believe it would be a fairly short-ish report, um, but I believe this would be something we'd, we'd probably have to have some collaboration with um, our colleagues at the Municipal Association um, in terms of, you know, from a legal standpoint, you know, we know where our jurisdiction is over, over energy. Getting into sort of the local things can get a little bit you know, trying to find, tease out the details. We're not necessarily experts on that, but I believe if there's uh, willing cooperation from the Municipal Association, I think we could we could put together something. Does this have to be exact today, or do, do we have more, a little more time? This has to be exacted today. So, with that being said. Well, I, I personally would be in favor of this because it's my understanding that there's some ambiguity around this. I mean, I don't think that municipalities have full authority to um, you know prohibit types of energy but um, Senator Waters made some good points in committee yesterday that there are things like net zero goals and and that's contemplated his amendment so I think it would be useful to all of us to understand what the authority is rather than act pursuant to 1148. Senator Gray had a question or comment? Senator, oh I thought you were Senator Gatta. Yeah. I'm going to support the original bill. And the reason I say that is that energy systems are not local. They're at least regional, if not multi-state and, and national potentially. And I'm, I am concerned uh, with the ability of a particular community to interfere with the delivery of energy, either in current systems that they would then restrict or future types of energy that might come online. Um, that's my reason for supporting the original bill. It doesn't mean we can't study something as well. Um, but right now, there's, as you know, we're, we're looking at all sorts of offshore wind, we're looking at natural gas we're, and, and so forth. Um, I don't think local communities should have the ability to interdict the provision of energy um, to an individual customer by choice or to interrupt that flow of energy to, to an entire system. I would support studying the bill, uh, studying the issue, in addition to well, uh, if I may say, putting that, Mr. Chairman, I you know, I I um, kind of had some sympathy for the underlying bill. You know, I mean, I, I think that we, you know, Massachusetts is talking about this, and they've decided to do a pilot program. Let some communities maybe do this, but I, I do think it's a state 
the state authority here because I, we don't want this kind of balkanized little map of right. this and that. Um, I don't think there's any immediate issue that that might happen, but I would say that if we pass this now, then the question there about the th things being void that are already there, and we've got some, we've got some, you know, hydro plants that are supplying energy, and and um, it's not, you know, it's about fuel types, and that, you know, gets to just so many, um, so many things. It's not saying to, you know, I, I just think it's very complicated, and if. If we did this now, I just think it's it's a you know lawsuits waiting to happen. Um, and so I what, so what if we exempt already existing systems uh, and put it a repeal date on the prohibition? Well, pending discussion. I I guess that I don't see the point of passing the prohibition now at all anyway, since it's not a it's not an exigent issue. Nobody's doing it, and. Why not get the answers first if there's no, um, you know, why not get the answers first and then, you know, the, we'll have a chance to, and things will change over the next couple of years too, we'll have a clear picture of where we're at in these things. I mean, I think hydrogen's going to be a big play and that's a huge issue and I wouldn't want anything to get in the way of that either. That'd so be an explosive debate. Yeah, well. <laughs> but it, it, I guess I'm, I guess I'm trying to say to Senator Avard is that I understand some of the energies behind this, no pun intended. But um, but I, I think that I think we need to get some questions answered. That's all. Anyway. All right. Well, the amendment has been moved and seconded. So further discussion. All right. So all in favor of the amendment. Aye. Aye. Any Aye. opposed? Seeing nobody's opposed. Uh, I'm about to pass as amended. Is there a second? Further discussion? All in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? No. All right. And Senator Gatti, would you like to take this out? <laughs> Just I would love that. <laughs> Senator Waters, you have the privilege. Okay. <laughs> uh, yes. Yeah. And, and so, thank you, colleagues. I think it makes sense. Well, Anybody hungry for some gray squirrel? <laughs> Senator, let's take I, a I will, I'll move ITL, and I, or I, I don't think we need to study. I'll move ITL. Second. And if I may speak, Mr. Chairman. Yeah. Um, you know, I think this problem that people may be having with squirrels actually can be solved, and that they do have a right to take them and shoot them. Um, and we heard from Fish and Game that if it's, it's really an FIS issue. You know, there's in rules that governs how you can take nuisance animals. Maybe they need to tweak it for the squirrels, and maybe they need to tweak it to say not just the property owner, but somebody he delegates can shoot the squirrels. And I think that that would, that would take care of it. Um, and I just want to tell you how nervous I am about in this whole hunting season thing, taking the authority over one species away from the director. And, I, and, and there is a lot of history around why we haven't done that. And the last thing I'll say is that um, we have a Fish and Game Commission now, which is kind of newly constituted, new members, and I think is, is really doing a very effective job. And I think that they will not duck issues, I think they will take them on seriously. And if they want to make some considerations about what to do in FIS 300, on this, I, I, I have real confidence that they they will. And as I happen to know, one of the major players in that commission is a is an avid squirrel hunter. So <laughs> I think that. Uh, so, anyways, I, I I hope we can let this one go. Further discussion. Senator Guida. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'm I'm going to vote in opposition to ITL. And the department has came before the committee with no idea why red squirrels are open year-round and gray squirrels are not. Okay. Um, I don't see anything other than color. I'm sure there's some name differences and so forth and maybe some other minor genetic differences, but they're pests. That's one item. Second issue, how are you going to enforce this? If I see a gray squirrel and I shoot it, Colonel Jordan's not going to know. His game wardens are not going to know. I'm certainly not going to shoot it in a compact area. Right? So there's no way to enforce this. 
It's well intended. You're going to make a farmer trap a damn squirrel that's chewing on his line? I mean, the common sense of this, uh, of, of, of trying to enforce something on a species that I can hide in my shoe, okay, escapes me. And for that reason, I support the bill. There's no biological reason that the department could produce. But we've got regulations and rules that have been in existence for God knows how long. And, and um, they may be willing to research it and produce it. I think uh, Mr. Bergeron's wanting to say well, something. Um, yeah, I, I wanted to see if Senator Gray had anything that he wanted to say. I think the long-term solution is to go look at the requirements for the pests and make it less onerous on both the department and the person being pestered to take that animal. Now, if it were a uh, endangered species or some other special thing, then certainly there could be a restriction on it. But I'll tell you, in my neighborhood, there is no lack of gray squirrels. <laughs> um, the idea of deputizing your employees to be able to shoot them too. I mean, obviously, the, the, the representative uh, um, had there, issues where he can't he can't monitor the entire. There is not time in this legislative session to do the work that would be required to do that. Correct. Uh, department. And hit your mic. Dan Bergeron, Wildlife Division Team. Uh, thank you for letting me um, come up and speak again. Um, I did find the answer. Sorry, I did not have that before, but I did find the answer for why there's open seasons on red squirrels. Um, in RSA, um, there's no definition of, um, or the definition of small game does not include red squirrels. So um, the legislature did not give the department authority to manage red squirrels or chipmunks. Um, gray squirrels are specifically listed as a small game species. So I guess the question is, in the absence of regulation on them, there's no shortage of red squirrels either. So we have a regulation that makes no common sense whatsoever. It is in existence. You're not going to stop me from shooting a gray squirrel that's climbing a tree next to my house. I'm not going to go to the department to, to ask a police officer or an agent, an officer of the uh, department to come into my house so I can take the... It's not going to happen. Folks, gray squirrels are a rodent pest. Okay, and all we're doing here is perpetuating bureaucracy... If we didn't have the red squirrel issue and if red squirrels were extinct, that would be one thing. They're not. So my suggestion is, and I will be voting in support of the bill, okay, that we get rid of unnecessary bureaucracy. I would ask the department, how many investigations have been done on the shootings of gray squirrels out of season and how many prosecutions have there been in the last 10 years? Yeah, that would, that would be a, a question for our law enforcement division. <laughs> so to answer your question, Senator, and I have, I have two two thoughts on this, but to answer your direct question, um, I, I don't have the exact number. I will tell you that we have made them. Uh, uh, there's no, and we, we had an issue last year with a sitting legislator over a gray squirrel. So we have had those issues. Uh, it's not widespread by any stretch. So how much money did the department spend on prosecuting that issue for one we, squirrel? That one I, I related to you, we didn't prosecute. So we we take the opportunity for a land, when a landowner oversteps his bounds, typically what I recommend to, the, to my officers is that you go and educate that landowner and mitigate his damages rather than make a case on it. If I have an outright poacher who is seeking to kill these things randomly and just ignore all the rules, then we would prosecute him. And have you had any of those happen? I have not for gray squirrels since I've been the colonel, no, sir. So currently, the season now goes through January 31st? That is correct. And um, so, and we rather recently, well, we did extend that season, right? I see a yes from behind you. Yeah, I think we did. I believe we did, yes. And this all came about as a, as a request to reduce the season yeah. originally. So um, the uh, other fact of the matter is, and maybe I'll look for a head nodding behind you, is that the sugaring season starts in February. Yes. So you could 
shoot as many squirrels as you want up to January 31st and clean them out, and then you're sugar for your next six weeks or so. Uh, that's that you could do that. Yes, we we have this problem with a number of different species. We have it with deer. We have it with bear. We give out depredation permits, really, to address that. You have to be careful of making people agents because we've had some bad experiences with that where people take advantage of that. We have a roving team that go around looking for depredation permits so they can hunt deer year round, but, but we monitor that stuff pretty closely. With the amount of hunters that are out there, uh, it's just not in my belly to, 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 to get a, eat one, but is there a high demand to hunt gray squirrels? I got to tell you, in 31 years doing this this year, uh, I have checked less than five squirrel hunters in my career. Um, now, remember, half my career was spent in the North Country where there were not a lot of gray squirrels. And down here, there are a lot of them. But I don't see, I, I can't say that that is in high demand, no. Right, Senator Gray. I want to relay the story to Senator Rayvard uh, that as a child, my mother, my dearly departed mother, uh, was very, very sick with the flu. And her, one of her fondest memories of her childhood <laughs> is her father gray going squirrel. out and harvesting a gray squirrel and making the squirrel soup with that for her recovery. Now, was that in New Hampshire? No, it was in the hills of West, West Virginia. Virginia. <laughs> West, by God, Virginia. Take me back home. <laughs> was that, an, appro <laughs> was that well, an approved remedy by the uh, FDA? <laughs> So, and, and there are people out there that are actively feeding these squirrels as well. Sure. And, and so sure. there's, there's a... They're small animals, so they're very, they're like any small animal, they're popular, you know, with, the, with, with our citizenry. Uh, so, I mean, if every hunter went out there and started hunting, not that that would be the case. Right. Uh, do you think they would turn into an endangered species? I, I could only guess at that. I mean, I, I don't, I don't, I don't. I feel fairly confident that our population would withstand that. The one challenge would be, the one challenge that you should consider is if in fact there were an emergency like you've just described, how quickly could we address that? And so I, I wanna leave you with this thought. It's quicker to do it in rule by far than it is in the legislature. So it takes us to address an emergency situation, something set by law, it takes us a good deal longer to do that in the le within the legislature. In rule, we can do that fairly quickly. And that's one of the arguments that we use uh, at the Fish and Game Committee regularly when, when we ask to not lose that authority to regulate seasons. That's the reason we, we want to do that. Is there a will in the department to make rules on this particular topic and change the rules? Um, you mean to go to an open season? Yeah. I don't know that we've explored that. To be honest with you, I so I don't, I don't know the answer to that. If I were to honestly yeah, answer it, in the earlier testimony, I mean, the, the I, or somebody said, you know, the, the rules could be looked at in terms of easing the capabilities of a landowner to take. Yes, I don't think it's I we I personally don't didn't see the need to shorten the season. I thought that was not a good idea, no. and that's how this started. Was they came no. to us to shorten it? The department felt the same way. Didn't feel there was a biological reason to do that, and we ended up here. <clears throat> in that there's no coverage for the red squirrel population by by law yes is there a need to regulate the gray squirrel population <laughs> that is a good question sir. that's the question yes. that's taker. and i don't i don't i would defer to dan he is certainly more of an expert on that than i am but that is a good question equal protection under the law isn't, yeah. isn't there a, a question though about you know the reason grays are in there is because they are hunters Yes. I don't think I don't think there's a whole lot of return on investment in hunting red squirrels because they're, they're so small there's, there's no meat. Yeah, but they're a pain in the butt when you're and not chipmunks. The they, same they do a lot of damage too. <laughs> yeah. I've, I've heard that fricasseed chipmunk is quite a delicate. <laughs> yeah, <animal. laughs> All right, so uh, all good questions. Thank all very good questions. Thank, thank you, you, sir. <laughs> we appreciate your testimony. Thank you very much. I want to move along here, so, uh, unless there's further discussion on this particular. Um, all right, so let's bring it to the vote. Uh, all in favor of ITL, say aye. Aye. All opposed? Uh -huh. uh, aye. Okay, so the uh, ITL has it, and uh, who would like to take it out? What was the chair's count on the vote? Three to two.
Yeah, it's uh, three to two. Uh, three squirrel lovers. <laughs> uh, will I take it out? All right. Can you take it out? Well, no. I'll take it out, and, and I'll, I'll be very brief. You can make your speech, okay? <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right. The squirrel is safe. All right. Uh, did we do 1049? Uh, establishing committees and study landfills. Let's do it. I move on to pass. And I Senator one, two. Is it, has this been seconded? Second. Seconded by Senator Perkins Quoka. So I have a formal amendment drafted. However, I think your amendment might be identical and simpler. I just had thought a community amendment added on line 27, solar panels. I think that's what the, the sponsor of the solar panels bill wanted us to do. That's exactly what my amendment does, is add recycling of solar panels to the scope of this, so I would be in favor of supporting Senator Waters' amendment. How about Rubio voting? <laughs> there would be problems. How about it? <laughs> so we're going to, on line 27, we're going to add solar panels and windmill vanes. And Senator Gaida, I mean Senator... Uh, I, I would Fred. ask all of those who are talking about adding things to this, why aren't they covered under the Solid Waste Working Group, which, in my opinion, as your representative on that, they already are. Senator Waters. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I, hear, I hear that. I think that there was... Um, I think this in some ways came out of the ferment over Malden and everything else we've been looking at. And, um, you know, I would refer to you, Senator Ray, because you're on the, on the uh, committee, but I did talk with um, Representative Ebell a little bit about it. And they, there was some sense that because this is focusing on the EPR and what the other states have done, um, that this was timely to have this relatively um, focused subject to tee up what may be legislative, what people may want to put in. So that, that was the rationale, and I, and I think people were willing to do it, and um, it also solves us, you know, a couple of issues. But Senator Gatta. A question for Senator Gray. Is the thing proposed in this bill already covered under the uh, land, what would you call it, the working group that you're on? The committee is charged with st uh, studying all of the solid waste and I, I want to make sure that you guys know that there are working groups on there which I can't attend uh, all of those meetings in fact because of their scheduling I have found it difficult even to ex to make the full meeting and I have made arrangements with the chair that uh, to offer uh, positions on those working groups uh, to the four of you or any other senator that that wants to attend those working groups in my place um, so you know I'm wondering who's going to if we pass this I'm wondering who's going to get assigned this duty um, definitely Senator Gaida well if I may Mr. Chair just to follow up um, the two things that are here is that getting back and focused, quickly focused on that issue of the siting. And um, then secondly, the EPR. And you know, what are part of the house was there are a lot of EPR bills, there are a lot of this bills, there are a lot of that bills. We know about the siting bills and so on. And that this recommendation for this study was a kind of a compromise coming out of there. Both parties took the fort and said, okay, let's focus in on this study to do these things. We know the commission is, is ongoing, or the other one is, is ongoing, but this would be useful. So, I mean, I, I don't know. I mean, I, it, I don't think that, you know, Rome stands or falls on whether or not this passes, but I, I think it's reasonable. Further discussion? Yeah, let me give you the language I think we ought to use. Um, so after batteries, comma, solar panels, comma, wind power components, 
comma, and then it continues. Yep. A question for you, Senator Gray. Do you feel that your working group scope encompasses um, what we see in lines 19 through 21 here concerning the I believe that their charge takes care of everything in the bill. Is it actually individually called out in the working group right now? Probably not. But and how frequently um, does your working group report out? Uh, report out, I'm not sure what the report dates are. They've been meeting between every month or every other month, and then now they've established those uh, working committees. Um, you know, they're, they're establishing their own. And as I said, I've been having difficulty fitting in with my schedule uh, they've either scheduled it in conjunction with the uh, Assessing Standards Board or they've scheduled on the same day as the Health and Human Services Oversight Committee. And so I haven't been able to attend, you know, full meetings for several months now. Uh, and those uh, committee, subcommittee meetings, um, you know, are beyond what I can do. Senator Guy. Would it make sense to amend this bill to direct that working group to address these issues as opposed to forming another committee? In the spirit of reducing. Yeah, we could do that. Funds. And um, I would recommend that we, so we'd have to have a committee amendment that. Pardon? I'm reducing senator participation in, <laughs> in committees and working groups. So now it means Senator Gray will have to also study all these things. <laughs> so is there a proposal for a committee amendment? While you're thinking about that, since we, <laughs> since we are talking solid waste, we ought to talk about the siting requirements, which are part of this. And the testimony we heard on our other bill, 1454, 1454 uh, that uh, the people who said that we should accept the main method of having a six-year travel didn't or may not have gone into the main law uh, as far as they should have because there is a system of, I'm going to call them buybacks or whatever, where if you put a liner in, you get uh, two years taken off, if you put in a leak detection system, if you put in a, a uh, septage recovery system, if you put in, and many of these people who are doing this uh, get the whole six years back because of those systems, and you're left with either 300 feet, uh, 500 feet, or 1,000 feet, depending on whether it's a road or an airport or other things, um, which is very similar to the Hampshire's law. So I'm not even sure that the siting stuff in here, um, <coughs> that it's, it's, you know, should be done the way it's done in here. It's, uh, yeah, I think right. that our law requires all of those things that allow you to reduce that six years down to zero years. And uh, so right. I don't see a big need for it. So is there a committee amendment? I, if I may, Mr. Chairman, um, to the point that Senator Gray just brought up, I'm sure without going into any details, I imagine he's spoken with Senator Bradley recently. Um, and I think there's going to be other options on that one. And well, for I have not spoken I'll, to him. So. I'll catch up with you after this. Um, so I think the situation is, I, I don't know how we craft an amendment right now that would direct that. I mean, we could. it's a little difficult for me to think how we what the language would be here that we'd put in. We could do that. Um, I also think that the, I don't want to say there's not a harm in this, but I would, I would say that if there are four people who are interested in taking on these topics over the next few months, I think they do, I think they provide some good information. Would it then perhaps go to the um, existing committee? Yeah. Would it probably help them out to have gotten, gotten a leg up on some of these issues? Yeah, I think it would. Um, 
and uh, so I guess I, I mean I still think I think it'd be I under I really hear the arguments about this. I think it'd still be helpful to pass this and let it let it do its thing for the next few months, and I think we'll be doing some good. Okay, let's move right along for the discussion. Minor amendment, which will change both the spelling and certainly the context of line one on page two. The word roll should be spelled R-O-L-E. We're not trying to roll the landfills and incinerators. <laughs> Maybe they can be mobile next, right? The mobile landfills, right? So no, no groundwater problem. You got that, Barry? <laughs> I'll move the uh, I'll move the committee amendment. Seconded by Senator Cooper Polka. For the discussion, all in favor of the committee amendment. Aye. No. And did it pass? Yes. Did you? Did you see? Okay. No, four to one. On four to one. Yeah. On on the committee amendment. All right. I'll move back to pass as amended. No, I roll. All right. <laughs> I'll move back to pass as amended. <laughs> All right, second by second, Senator Perkins Polka. Um, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? No. no. So, is there another motion? I'll move right to L. Who? It, it, it failed. Okay. Three to two. All right. Two to three. It failed three to two. Yeah. I, I, as it passed, yes. OTP pa failed. So, I'll make it in. Right? Yes. I see how. Second by Senator Zayas. Uh, discussion. All in favor of ITL. I just think, really, for the record, quickly, I think that the functions anticipated here are, are duplicative. They're being performed elsewhere. And for that reason, uh, I think this is unnecessary uh, okay. legislation. Thank you. My, my sentiments exactly. Oh, I should have that on there. My sentiment is exactly. I think we're just adding layer upon layer. So. Uh, the duties aren't even being met at, at this point uh, completely. So with that, um, all in favor of ITL? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? No. Okay. Senator Gray, you get the privilege. Take this out. Okay. What do we got left? One more. Oh. Various changes. Okay, sure. this passed 22 to 0. Senator Perkins Coco with an amendment. So, Alan, I'm going to Second. Okay, discussion. All right, the department seemed to like this. There was nobody really against this. Uh, but, Senator Perkins Coco, you have an amendment of 1787S, yes. and you may speak to your amendment. Thank you, Chair. Um, so, I I brought this amendment as a result of several conversations that were had over the course of yesterday and last night. Um, I think you guys may recall that um, Senator Avard brought forward SB 259, which clarified um, the public entities which could participate in the limited um, net metering that we passed last year. Uh, Senator Avard and I combined bills um, into SB 259, and um, that bill received an interim study recommendation coming out of committee in the House. However, um, in discussions last night, there appears to be willingness to support only including the state entities um, as an expansion. And so the amendment I have before you needs um, more. needs a committee amendment yes. um, in addition um, to simply limit the added text to the state 
of New Hampshire. Removing the online 18 or 17, I mean, yeah, 17 and 18. Yep. Housing Authority, Quasi Public Entity, and Peace Development Authority. Yep. Um, so I'll second. And if I may say, Ms. it was great work on this, and I really appreciate Chairman Vo's um, understanding the logic, and I think maybe even being open to the rest of this perhaps next year, but for now, yeah. um, this is a, a good step forward, and I think makes a lot of sense. So, Daly, can you just repeat where we're striking on the committee amendment? Uh, I'm on the yes. Senator Perkin Cuoco. Yep. So uh, the all of the bolded text on lines 17 and 18 will be struck. So. Um, all will be removed. Correct. And the Orange District uh, or entity created for special purposes that that should remain. That should no. remain. Yeah. So yeah. it it's will read. Existing language. School administrative unit, comma, or any district or entity created for a special purpose. Excellent. Perfect. Thank so you. We, the discussion. We need um, some other items that came out of the hearing for committee amendment. Okay. So, uh, Daily, on page three, two, on line 20, this is on the 12th of date as amended by the House. Zero to five years. Except to add the word to. Where? All right, on line 20, towards the very end, we have to insert the word to, T O, between pursuant and an. Yeah. Yeah. Senator Guida, Eagle Eye. You own that. Page 2, line 20. Yeah. That's the last word. Yeah. Pursuant, pursuant to. to. Okay. T O. And then if you go to page three, so this was the question on um, page three, the um, reference to the committee deleted by House Bill 1270. Right. So um, you see on line 12 yep. uh, and 13, you'd want to strike the words and the legislative oversight committee. Okay, you get that? And then, um, then we want to say instead of that, after J J11, See on line 12, you got to see that 125 J colon yep. 11. Yes. So, comma, to the chairs of House Science, Technology, and Energy and Senate Energy and Natural Resources. <coughs> so, I, I, I'm sorry, I probably should say and, just and. So, uh, I'm sorry, 125 J11, colon 11, <coughs> then add and the chairs. Could we change that to the committees of jurisdiction, then we don't have to change it again if somebody changes the title? But then it'll be I think everywhere else, if you're everywhere else in the, in the, it's referring to, um, in 1270, it's referring to the just by trying. name. Yeah. yeah, I know. <laughs> so, it would say chairs of, um, House Science, Technology, and Energy, and Senate Energy and Natural Resources. You want to repeat it just real quick? And then you will have stricken and the Legislative Oversight Committee. Further discussion? All in favor of the committee amendment? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Just a second. Oh, no, we're not sure what this thing. Uh, we're, we're good. Okay. We're good. We're good. We're good. We're good. We're good. Okay. All in favor of the bill as amended? Well, we need to move it. And move the bill uh, to pass as amended? Is there a second? 
Yes. Senator Guida, okay. Perkins Coca, Jen Guida, and so for discussion, all in favor of the bill as amended? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Seeing none. Consent. There, there is a motion for consent. Yes. Senator Guida seconds it. All in favor of consent? Aye. 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 Can I take it out? Any opposed? Seeing none. Senator Perkins Coca, you get to take it out. Well woo, done, woo, folks. Woo, woo. You did it, Mr. Chairman. Oh, well, we did woo. it. Half an hour to spare. <laughs> Tons of time. Half an hour to party. <laughs> yeah, well. <laughs> what do you want to do? <laughs> All right, with that, is there a motion to move out of exec? Move. All in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Aye. Seeing none. Thank you, everybody. You can go party. I'm going to go to my office and bang my head on my desk. <laughs> <laughs>